Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, the climate guy setting the record straight about climate. This video is titled, How Did We Survive the 1970s? Practically every year during the 1970s, scientists posed a new mortal threat to our existence. I'm going to cover a number of those in this video and discuss the reason why they were occurring. The American philosopher H. L. Mencken wrote, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. Let's look at some of those hobgoblins. In 1969, the world's leading population expert Paul Ehrlich from Stanford University told the New York Times, we must realize that unless we're extremely lucky, everybody will disappear in a cloud of blue steam in 20 years. The trouble with almost all environmental problems is that by the time you have enough evidence to convince people, you're dead. So according to the New York Times and the world's leading population expert, we were all going to be dead by 1989. But Ehrlich was just getting started. A year later, Ehrlich said, the oceans will be as dead as Lake Erie in less than a decade. The DDT in our fatty tissues has reached levels high enough to cause brain damage and cirrhosis of the liver, and America will be subject to water rationing by 1974 and food rationing by 1980. Ehrlich described all the great progress we made against pollution during the 1960s as giving aspirins to cancer victims. So by the end of 1970, we were going to disappear in a cloud of blue steam, we were going to run out of food and water, and we were going to die from DDT poisoning. But in 1970, scientists were just getting started with their apocalyptic predictions. In 1972, 42 top American and European climate scientists met at Brown University and then wrote a letter to President Nixon warning of a new ice age within a century. Brown University, December 3, 1972. Dear Mr. President, aware of your deep concern with the future of the world, we feel obliged to inform you on the results of the scientific conference held here recently. The conference dealt with the past and future changes of climate and was attended by 42 top American and European investigators. The main conclusion of the meeting was that a global deterioration of climate by order of magnitude larger than any hitherto experienced by civilized mankind is a very real possibility and indeed may be due very soon. The cooling has a natural cause and falls within the rank of processes which produced the last ice age. The present rate of cooling seems fast enough to bring glacial temperatures in about a century. So it was only 1972 and we were already going to disappear in a cloud of blue steam. We were going to die of thirst, die of hunger, die of DDT poisoning, and now an ice age was going to come get us too. Ehrlich predicted that we would run out of water by 1974, but I don't think that happened. So he switched over to a different scam in 1974. He switched over to the global cooling scam. July 31st, 1974, Stanford biologist Paul Ehrlich, author of the highly successful book, The Population Bomb, is an immensely likable guy. He's also deeply concerned about the fate of the planet and all of its inhabitants. Paul Ehrlich has noticed yet another dark cloud on the horizon. Reed Bryson and some other climatologists are now pretty certain that the climate we experienced from 1930 to 1960 was the peak warmth of a thousand year cycle. The world will not again enjoy such good weather for another hundred decades. Ehrlich was so deeply concerned about the fate of all of the inhabitants of the planet that he wanted to poison them. The UN held a conference in 1969 in San Francisco and Ehrlich told him that we needed to poison the food and water supply in Africa. A sterility drug in food is hinted. Biologists stresses need to curb population growth. San Francisco, November 24th, 1969. A possibility that the government might have to put sterility drugs in reservoirs and in food ship to foreign countries to limit human multiplication was envisioned today by a leading crusader on the population problem. The crusader, Dr. Paul Ehrlich of Stanford University, among a number of commentators who called attention to the population crisis. As the United States Commission for UNESCO opened its 13th national conference here today, UNESCO is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. 
So the United Nations wanted to poison people in Africa. It should also be noted that Ehrlich was a very close associate of John Holdren, who went on to be Obama's science advisor. By 1974, we were going to die of thirst, we are going to die of hunger, we are going to die from DDT poisoning, we are going to die in a cloud of blue steam, global cooling was going to kill us, and scientists wanted to poison us too. But they were really just getting started. Again in 1974, our top scientists took their concerns about global cooling and a new ice age to the president. The cooling, so writes Stephen Schneider, a young climatologist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, reflecting the consensus of the climatological community. In his new book, The Genesis Strategy, Schneider warned that present world food reserves are an insufficient hedge against future famines as has been heard among the scientific community for years. For example, it was a conclusion of the 1975 National Academy of Sciences report. But Schneider has decided to explain the entire problem as responsibly and accurately as he can to, to the general public, and thus has put together a useful and important book. Schneider quotes University of Wisconsin climatologist Reed Bryson as saying that the 1930 to 1960 warmth was the most abnormal period in a thousand years. In fact, conditions of a steady warm weather in the northern hemisphere during that time favored bumper harvests in the United States, the Soviet Union, and the wheat belt of northern India and Pakistan. In 1974, Schneider and Bryson tried to explain to a White House policymaking group why conditions are likely to worsen. One of the most depressing anecdotes in the book is Snyder's description of the deaf ear their warnings received. It must have been hard for the president to keep up with all these apocalypses. We had the cloud of blue steam, we were going to run out of water, we were going to run out of food, DDT was going to kill us, we were going to have global cooling, the government was supposed to poison us. How was Nixon supposed to know what to be worried about? But as I said, the scientists were really just getting started. In 1977, Jimmy Carter, the nuclear engineer, as he called himself, warned that we were going to run out of oil in the first decade of the 21st century. The hard truth, as the Carter administration sees it, is that the world's oil supplies cannot much longer sustain the world's increasing oil consumption. The world's oil will disappear in the first decade of the 21st century. So things are bad. We're going to die in a cloud of blue steam. We're going to run out of food. We're going to run out of water. Global cooling was going to kill us. DDT was going to get us. And now we're going to run out of oil too. I just don't see how things can get much worse. But apparently they can. In 1979, scientists told us that nuclear reactors were going to melt all the way through the earth and make Pennsylvania uninhabitable. Wednesday, March 21st, 1979, The China Syndrome, a film dramatizing America's worst fears of what could happen in nuclear power plants suffered a critical malfunction, opened at theaters across the nation last week, sending shockwaves to audiences and the nuclear energy industry alike. The furor concerning this film has risen because even though the accident portrayed in The China Syndrome is fictitious, many of the events leading up to it are based on actual occurrences. The film should be of particular interest to local viewers because it concluded that an area the size of Pennsylvania would be rendered uninhabitable by the China Syndrome. So we were all going to die in a cloud of blue steam, we were going to run out of food, we were going to run out of water, DDT poisoning was going to get us, global cooling was going to kill us, we were going to run out of oil, and now nuclear reactors were going to melt through the earth all the way to China, making Pennsylvania uninhabitable. But that wasn't the only thing that was going to make Pennsylvania uninhabitable. Things just kept getting worse. By 1980, acid rain was also going to make Pennsylvania uninhabitable. February 7, 1980, highly corrosive acid rain is serious threat to Pennsylvania. He doesn't see it, feel it, or smell it, but when it rains or snows east of the Mississippi, sulfuric acid falls on a man's head. What we see is frightening a lot of scientists, says Dr. George Hendry, a researcher at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. It's a lot worse than we thought. The Carter administration has asked Congress for a 10-year, $100 million federal acid rain assessment program. And that's really the crux of all this. Scientists need funding to keep their research going. In order to get funding, they have to scare people. They have to tell people scary stories. 
If they don't, nobody's going to give them money to tell them, oh yeah, there's really no problem, everything's okay. So they make up stories like global warming, global cooling. There always has to be a crisis going on. And this suits the needs of government perfectly. Politicians also want to have a crisis going on all the time. Mencken said, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence clamorous to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. So scientists wanted to create imaginary hobgoblins and government wants it too. So they work together, they fund each other and they help each other out. We didn't die in a cloud of blue steam, we didn't run out of water, we didn't run out of food, DDT didn't kill us, global cooling didn't kill us, global warming didn't kill us, acid rain didn't kill us, we didn't run out of oil. None of these things happen, yet people keep insisting on believing this nonsense coming out of the scientific community. At some point we need to grow up and we need to start dealing with reality. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science for a long time.